All right. All right, so one of my uh, favorite uh, events always at JuliaCon is the hackathon. Last year I was unable to attend for family reasons, and so on the plane home I decided to do my own hackathon project. I always like to do something that impacts both my work, but also hopefully is sort of a, just a general tool that maybe helps support other people too. And um, I asked myself, what, were the, what was uh, one of the areas of, of frustration for myself in the current Julie, and what could I do to help make it better? And that actually was a fairly easy uh, you know, sort of thing to come up with, and that was simply the amount of time that I spent waiting for uh, code to compile. I wanted to, to, to reduce that amount of time. And the reason I decided to start tackling that was because a new opportunity, uh, well, really, in a sense, the fundamental fix for that had, 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 had just, uh, had just uh, uh, been committed. And um, just to give you as, as a little bit of an example, um, you know, here I'm imagining that I have a, a, a bit of code, and this has an off by one bug in it, and I've already loaded the package that contains this line and running it, and I discovered it has a bug. I want to edit it and, and change it. Now, in older versions of Julia, your only recourse really was to shut Julia down and restart again, because while you could fix this particular function, any function that depended on it was permanently wired in, uh, to have the bug. Um, in Julia 0.6, Jameson Nash uh, fixed this in, 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 in a, in a uh, really beautiful way. He made it so that you could redefine this method in its fixed version here in its appropriate module. And then uh, all of the functions that depended upon bug would be recompiled and you could keep working in your session. And so this really opened the floodgates for me for uh, becoming much more efficient in, in the usage of Julia. And uh, before, uh, I should mention that there's a fantastic IDE called Juno. Probably, hopefully many of you are using it actively in your own work. It simplifies the manual labor of sort of copy pasting this line into your command line prompt. You can just put your cursor in that function, hit control enter, and it, and it redefines it again in the right module. Um, and, and, and you're off, you know, uh, back up and running again. All right. Um, however, this was not actually the full end of the story for me because I had seen a couple of cases where it couldn't uh, sort of handle the kind of changes that I wanted to make in code. And a really good example of it was this. What if at the same time as you were fixing the bug, you said, you know, this int, I was too specific in this statement here. I want to generalize, you know, w w the signature for my function as well. And so I'm going to evaluate this version. And the problem with that is, is that then if you do that, you end up with getting two methods of bug. You get one, the fixed version here, but that's actually of lower precedence than the version here that you have that is the buggy version of that. And so what that means is that the session that you're running right now isn't actually reflective of what would happen in a fresh session had you started it. And so it's not very useful for continuing to do your development or debugging or, 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 or even just get your work done. All right. So what that indicated to me was that even really quite trivial changes in code sometimes need, might need a more sophisticated strategy. Now, if you were to try to fix this and take an editor-based strategy, you might imagine trying to write something like a track changes mode you know, for your editor. To me, that sounded really hard. Um, but the more, and, and so that seemed unappealing. The more important reason for me also was is that code can change in many ways that are not going through your editor. You might, for instance, update your packages and see if the package uh, you know, author has fixed the bug uh, for you already. Or something I do all my time in my work is I find I can't write a clean test case until I understand the bug. I don't know that I understand the bug until I basically fix the bug. And then, but then when you write your clean test case, you want to make sure that it catches the error on the old code. And what I do all the time is I, you know, stash the old version of the code, run my test, verify that it errors, unstash my code, verify that it works, and then I know I'm, then I, know I have a very good fix. And I use this workflow 30 times a day, you know, if I'm actively fixing bugs, and I wanted this to be able to work for me uh, as well. And so there's another way, and maybe an editor-independent approach to trying to solve this, and that is to take a uh, sort of inspiration from some very old-fashioned Unix tools like diff and patch. And the important thing in this example that I'm giving here is that not only do, does diff understand that you're adding this method here, but that you need to delete this method here as well, right? And that's very clear from the format of this file. And what I basically wanted to do was create diff and patch for a running Julia session, right? So diff, patch, and git handle that for your file system, but it doesn't happen for your, for your live Julia. 
session. And that's really the, what, what was the motivation behind this package that I developed called Revise, right? And there are only, it's, it's actually really quite simple. It only needs a couple of things. It needs a list of the files that your code, running code, depends upon. And it has to be able to watch them for changes. And it has to have a well-organized set of the expressions that get defined uh, as a consequence of those packages. And um, well-organized means a couple of things. You have to know which module to evaluate every expression in. You also have to be able to compare expressions. And so, for example, really to show you how fundamentally simple the inner core of, of revise is, um, it's, it, 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 it's schematically, it's not really quite, quite like this, but schematically, it's basically you just, if you have an all of the expressions that were in the old version of the file and all of the expressions that were in the new version of the file. For anything that's in the old one but not in the new one, you want to delete it. And for anything that's in the new one and not in the old one, then you evaluate it to define it, right? So really dirt simple way of updating your current running Julia session. Now, this hides a little bit of complexity. So of course, first of all, you have to be able to delete methods. You couldn't do that in older versions of Julia. Uh, uh, Jameson spent a very uh, pleasant Sunday afternoon with me in a Boston cafe, and we managed to get that into Julia 0.7, so you can do that now. Um, and then the second thing is you have to, of course, um, you know, you have to go figure out exactly which method corresponds to this particular expression. And that's where a lot of the more sort of, let's say, uh, deeper stuff in Revise uh, uh, comes to play. And because I'm going to try to save some time for some demos, I'm going to be much briefer about this than I intended uh, when I first planned this talk. I'm just going to throw up a diagram here. What this really shows, this is as much for the aficionados as anyone else, what this really shows is the different sort of entities that are important um, in compiling, loading and compiling Julia code. And all the black arrows are things that are basically provided by base. And you can see that base has really good sort of support for the forward direction going from the source text to defining your methods here. And what Revise has basically done is essentially add a couple more arrows to this diagram so that you can go, for instance, from an expression and sort of non-destructively figure out which method it, 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 it corresponds to and then go and delete that method. Um, and then in a very, very, very recent change to Revise, just a couple of weeks old at this point, it also contains pointers, that, a, a dictionary that lets you go backwards from the method signatures to the expression themselves. And I added this recently because of one really long-standing annoyance that I had with Revise, and that was if you were heavily editing a, a file, your, your code was working better and all this kind of stuff, but if you got some old error in code that hadn't been reevaluated, because of changes to the file, it might have moved around in its line, in, in what line numbers it appeared on. And so the back traces you'd get would be all off in their, in their line numbers. And that makes it surprisingly hard to continue your work on that package. And so that was often a source for restarts. It took me a long time to sort of work up the courage to just doing what I had to do and be able to go backwards from these. And now the newest versions of Julia and Revise will actually correct those line numbers before they report them to you so everything should, 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 main, should be maintained in sync for you. Okay. So, Yes, revise is sort of diff and patch for your running Julia session, but I think, I hope that the diagram on the previous picture shows you that it's something more. It's that if basically if you need to do something that might involve relationships between different representations of the same code objects, revise is kind of a library for you that perhaps you should be, you should be, you know, you could pretend, potentially take advantage of. So about a week and a half ago when I was reading this, I thought, all right, well, if that's really true, maybe I should be sure that that is actually true. Could I actually create another project that actually depended upon Revise in a meaningful, uh, meaningful way? And my life went, you know, then crazy for the next week and a half of absolutely feverish coding. And today, I am now introducing to you a new package that I'm calling rebugger.jl. <laughs> <laughs> So rebugger um, uh, actually has three meanings. It means the REPL debugger. And of course, anybody who's used a command line debugger knows about you know, next step and continue and all that. That is not what I mean by REPL debugger. I'll show you in, in, in a moment. Um, it's certainly also the revise-based debugger, since it uses revise very heavily for all of its internal operations. Um, if you decide to play with this, I think you'll quickly get my experience, whereas a lot of its power comes from the ability to really isolate out little chunks of, of code and run them repeatedly to figure, to figure out what's going on in them. And so that's sort of the third meaning of that. And I'm going to switch now at this point actually to bravely doing a demo. I should say 
that this code is, of course, is, is unbelievably raw. It has many bugs that I still know about, but I am releasing it anyway, uh, bravely and demoing it foolishly um, so that people, people can give it a try to, 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 sh to show you how it works. So um, I'll launch Julia. I should say that, say that Rebugger actually works best on Julia 1.0, but you can also run it on 0 0.7, and I have some notes on the, in, in the readme about that. Okay, so I'm going to start, let's say, with a normal, normal Julia prompt, and I'm just going to uh, do something here where I show an array, and so um, you know that, that's the output that it gives you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back, and I'm going to position my cursor at the beginning of the expression, and what this basically is, is this is basically me marking the point in my code I want to step into. I'm then going to hit F11, and it's going to wait a second. It's going to tell you revise is now starting, has it just analyzed all the code in base and has set up these expression trees um, that it can follow. And then, it's, and then it puts this on your command prompt. So let's look at these things here. So the first thing in purple here is it says that we're descending into the show method, and it's defined at this line of code. This x here, it turns out this show method only has one argument, and x is the name of that argument, and it's giving you the value of what that argument is right here. You, got, you see this rebug, rebug prompt here? This add a value, you may recognize this. This is the sort of what we, you know, how you evaluate code in a different module. It wraps it in a let block so you don't contaminate your current running Julia session. It's going to load in the value of x in a stored cache that Rebugger maintains. Here's one of those big hex things, these UUIDs. Um, so that I guess that's the morning theme or something like that here, right? <laughs> and so you can enter it, and you can see it executes that line of code. Now I can go up in my, uh, with you, the back arrow as usual. I can position my cursor again, and I can hit uh, or sorry F11 again, and it will now descend into what that method calls. Um, and so I can uh, you know, navigate around this code. I might imagine that this is the next thing it's going to show, and I'm, my font size is going to get me in trouble here, I fear. Um, so uh, here we go. If I uh, navigate into this, one of the important things you can see, it didn't change. And you'll notice this little status line here is that the execution here did not ever actually reach, reach that point. So it actually ran an, uh, a different method here. And so you can do that. So you want to pay attention to that line. Anyway, so forth. You can easily descend into code. Another nice thing that you can do with Rebugger, and I don't think that, that it's possible to do this um, yet in any other um, way with Julia is, uh, here's just a little example uh, let's see here, um, uh, uh, where I've defined a module here of, uh, where that it, that it uh, uh, calls this very silly little cascade of functions. The last one of them de very deliberately just throws an error. And so I can say include t, and the t means that, it should, that revise should track it. Um, that's important for revise to be able to work um, using main.snoop, and so I can say snoop zero, and that, that throws the error that I engineered into here. I can do this again. I can hit F5, and it's going to descend into this, and it's going to show me the end, the, the sort of the final thing it got to in the stack trace where it did it the error. I can gloriously recreate the area. But then I can use the navigation keys of the REPL to go back up and down the, the, down the stack frames, right? And, and you just see here visual glitches. Thank you. Yeah. And that's basically, basically where, where I will leave it. Well, one of the, I want to make a couple other points. In a sense, if, so I actually think of a real debugger as something that can inspect and manipulate call stack, you know, the call stack. And by that criterion, you know, rebugger is not a debugger, right? That's Kano's job, right? That's, <laughs> that's you know, AST interpreter 2 and Gallium, right? And actually, I hope someday that the debugging guts of, of rebugger get replaced by his work there, right? Um, so, but what I might think actually about have, have a long uh, uh, standing life is actually the REPL interface for this. I, was, I did not see how this project was going to work out when I got into it. And I have to say, that Kano's REPL makes a really beautiful interface for a debugger. And in fact, I kind of think I, it, it gives you a lot of what a graphical debugger does. I'm actually starting to get hints that there may even be some advantages to it compared to any graphical debugger I've used before. And I can go into that in private or in, in questions if you want. But anyway, this has been a fun and interesting project. Um, I, if, if you try it, you will experience bugs and glitches. I'm sorry, it's very early days, but hopefully we'll be ironing those out in the next few weeks. Thank you very much. So.
we have time for one or two quick questions, and then the sessions are going to start on schedule in the um, in room 106 or Ambrose or um, the Darwin Lecture Hall here. Tim, this is fascinating. Um, you said you could maybe go into the details of why you think this is better than the, the yeah. GUI-based debugger, so could you? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 I mean, it, it, it'll be a mixed bag. I mean, the graphical debuggers obviously have some lovely things about them, but I, I guess I'm noting a couple of potential advantages of this approach, and, the, and essentially everything kind of stems from the fact that it, it actually kind of inverts the usual debugging. When you do debugging normally, you go into some specialized debugging mode, and that's a distinct mode from uh, your normal development mode. Rebugger sort of hauls all the debugging information out of it and puts it into your normal command line interaction. And so what that means is that, for instance, let's say that you're wanting to do a debugging session and you capture an error that took you an hour of computation to get into, right? I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but with the graphical debuggers, I've occasionally said, oh crap, I pushed continue one too many times and now I have to restart my debug session from scratch, right? Here, you never, ever will have to do that, right? Because it captures the input state at every stage. You go right back to the function that was running the moment it threw an error. It might be a microsecond until you get to, to get to the bug again. The second thing is, is that at least in other debuggers that I've used, when you actually go and fix the bug, you have to leave the sort of debug session, and if you want to try it all again, you have to run it all again. Again, not here, right? You have the whole set of inputs, you fix your bug, save the file, and you run it again. And so, it, 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 I, you know, again, there will be some disadvantages, but I think in its very early days, I've worked, I've worked on it much more than I've used it, um, but, but I'm getting hints that it will have some nice advantages. Oh, another one that I, is actually this interface of putting point at the point you want to go into. Turns out, how many of you have, have, who have used graphical debuggers have, have set, let's say, a, a breakpoint at a line, and then when you step in, you, you're into like some ampersand thing instead of the actual function that you're really kind of hoping to step into. That never happens here. You put prompt right at the method that you actually want to go into. It could be halfway into a line nested inside of 15 parentheses or the outermost one, right? And you go into the one that you want. So, so there are some really nice things about the gorgeous REPL that Julia has um, as, an, as a gra semi-graphical interface for a debugger. Um. Okay, it, it looks. It, I mean, it looks fantastic. I was just wondering if you've got code that's, um, say, very slow, then um, then does it does it rerun the code to to work out what's happening every time you Ter step forward and backwards? Terrific question. So does it does it rerun the code? So when you're capturing the stack trace to go backwards, yes, it has to run the code twice to to get it. And that's what that be, that's because it isn't a real debugger, right? And the, I hope that you know Kano fixes this, right? When it's stepping in to code, it, it actually doesn't have to. It 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 it, it can all it can go down. It just can't go up the call stack. So. Okay, let's thank Tim, Tim again and.